Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome. I welcome you all to the first of the three Southwest Florida Climate Compass Speaker Series events. The Southwest Florida Climate Compass Series seeks to elevate the discussion of our changing climate in Southwest Florida by presenting diverse perspectives from national experts. This afternoon, we welcome Bob Inglis, Executive Director of Republican Org. Next slide. I'm Dr. Anna Pushkin Shevlin, Regional Director of Growing Climate Solutions. And I'm here with my colleague, Jennifer Roberts, the Director of Path to Positive at Eco America. A couple of things about our presentation today. First, we can anticipate that it will run about an hour and an hour and 15 minutes or so to leave enough time for questions and answers. Two, we encourage you to use the chat function for any questions you may have. We'll be monitoring the chat and we can even post some references if necessary. Three, this presentation will be recorded. So there's no reason to worry if you miss it or have to drop off or you wanna refer it to a friend, please go ahead. With this, I will talk to you a bit about, eco, about Growing Climate Solutions for those of you who haven't heard of it. It's a national, uh, Growing Climate Solutions is a network of diverse institutions, businesses, civic organizations in our five county region that are committed to five principles, building climate awareness through education and communication, like the event today, protecting our natural assets, engaging our local leaders to support climate actions and ensuring that climate resilience and prosperity is brought forth in an equitable manner. And most of all, we wanna become a role model, a role model for the entire country. So how do we do this? We do this through educational events in Zoom now and hopefully in person soon by building partnerships with other groups and bringing them together through projects and initiatives like supporting the Southwest Florida Resiliency Compact, or even small um, projects like planting trees, and also through our communications and outreach, our newsletter, our social media, our blog. And we partner with Eco America. Next slide, please. Here are the, the uh, images of us talking to folks, meeting with people, and some of our news publications, which you can receive if you sign up. Next slide. Jennifer. Thank you, Anna, and uh, welcome again to everyone who is joining us today. It's going to be a great conversation. I am with Eco America. I'm the director of Path to Positive Communities, and our mission is to build public support and political resolve for climate solutions across the United States. And we root everything in our commitment to justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion. And the Path to Positive Communities program is the one that works with local communities because we know that we can have local solutions to help with our climate. I also want to encourage you to use your chat function today. I'll be monitoring the chat and we'll have time for questions and answers at the end of the presentation. So back to you, Anna. So Growing Climate Solutions was founded by four of our very highly respected um, local organizations. So we want to take a moment to thank the Community Foundation of Collier County, the Southwest Florida Community Foundation, the Conservancy of Southwest Florida, and Florida Gulf Coast University. We're also generously supported by the Kapnick Family Foundation. Next slide. And most importantly, we also want to thank our media sponsors, the Naples Daily News and News Press and WGCU Public Media. And with this, I'm gonna turn it over to Rob Mower, the president and CEO of the Conservancy of Southwest Florida, who's going to introduce our speaker. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to be with all of you. Thanks for taking time uh, out of a beautiful day here in Southwest Florida to be with us for this uh, presentation on climate change. And um, I had the pleasure of, of meeting uh, Bob a little earlier today. And just uh, saying that the timing for this uh, topic of his address to us tonight is uh, so timely with everything happening in Texas. Um, with a uh, new administration coming in, the need to work across the aisle. And just a little bit about Bob, we're so pleased to have him with us. Uh, he has quite an 
distinguished career, uh, both as uh, a, a several term serving congressman, uh, but he also founded the Energy and Enterprise Institute at George Mason University back in 2012, uh, where he serves as the executive director. And in that role, he really encourages free enterprise action to address the challenges of climate change, which we think is certainly a very important topic. Um, one of his very distinguished awards that he has received for his service and his work uh, in 2015, he received the John F. Kennedy Profile and Courage Award. He's appeared in uh, several films uh, on the topic of climate change, and you might have also seen him uh, making presentations on the TED stage uh, in TEDx Beacon Street and TEDx in uh, Jacksonville. Uh, he's also been affiliated with Harvard University at the Institute of Politics. He's been a visiting energy fellow at Duke University, and uh, he grew up in South Carolina and went to Duke University where uh, he married his college sweetheart and uh, graduated from the University of Virginia uh, School of Law and uh, now lives in, in uh, South Carolina and uh, has served our country in Congress and in many other facets. So with that, just as an honor to welcome Bob Inglis to uh, share with us his perspective on uh, the climate change endeavors that uh, the United States faces and in fact the world faces. So welcome, Bob, and I'll turn it over to you. Well, thank you, Rob. Thanks, uh, Anna, Jennifer, for the opportunity to be with you. And thank you, all of you, for joining us um, on this webinar uh, to talk about conservative solutions to climate change. Whoa, must have gotten in the wrong place, right? Conservatives don't talk about climate change. Oh, that's what we're out to change at republicen.org uh, because we think that uh, conservatives actually suffer from an undeserved inferiority complex when it comes to climate change. And what we live to do at republicen.org is convince conservatives that they're really good and they've got really good ideas and that they should engage on climate. Um, and at the end of the day, I think we'll find that progressives actually agree on the solution. So uh, what you're about to hear though is high octane conservatism. So I warn you, if you're progressive, you're thinking, gee, man, hey, this guy's gonna be channeling Milton Friedman. Yep, that's what I'll be doing uh, because uh, we think that it is rock solid conservatism to talk about climate change. And so uh, first thing I guess I should do is tell you how I got into this. And then second, I'll, I'll uh, unpack that conservative solution to climate change. Um, because uh, at, at first you need to know how in the world did a conservative from South Carolina get in on this climate thing? I mean, it seems rather unlikely, right? Um, so uh, I'll tell you the tale. It's basically like this. My first six years in Congress, I said that climate change was nonsense. I didn't know anything about it, except that Al Gore was for it. Um, and in as much as I represented probably one of the most conservative districts in the con most conservative state in the country, that's Greenville, Spartanburg, South Carolina. That was the end of the inquiry for me. Okay, so I admit that's pretty ignorant, uh, but that's the way it was for my first six years in Congress. Al's for it, I'm against it, next thing. So um, then I was out of Congress six years doing commercial real estate law again in Greenville, South Carolina. Had the opportunity to run for the same seat, very same seat, in fact, uh, six years later, 2004. And so um, my son was voting for the first time that year. He just turned 18. He's the eldest of our five kids. And he came to me and said, Dad, I'll vote for you, but you're going to clean up your act on the environment. Um, his four sisters agreed. His mother agreed. That constitutes a, uh, a new constituency. You know, these people can change the locks on the doors. Uh, very important to respond to that constituency. Um, and, and by the way, my son was not uh, making the classic interest group threat, right? It wasn't in his economic interest to vote against me. It's possible to lose by one vote. And, uh, you know, Robert knew that we were mortgaging the farmette that we live on, literally, in order to run for Congress. Uh, maybe I should explain what a farmette is. Uh, I, I call a farmette what we are. You know, it's 27 acres, uh, th three horses, uh, 
14 chickens at the moment, um, dogs and cats, big garden. We pretend to be farmers, you know, it's sort of a green acres kind of move. Uh, so uh, my wife, I guess, is Zsa Zsa Gabor and I'm whoever the guy was. I can't remember what his name was. Anyway, so we're here at Green Acres, right? My, my son knew that we were mortgaging the farm at in order to run for Congress. So he's going to vote for me no matter what. I think what he's really saying was, Dad, I love you. And you can be better than you were before. So how about be relevant to my future and your four daughters' futures and get with it on climate change? So that was step one of a three-step metamorphosis for me. Step two was going to Antarctica with the science committee and seeing the evidence in the ice core drillings. You know, um, what the scientists do is really pretty exciting, but also fairly simple. Um, they drill down through the ice. They, they drill down through the ice and pull up these ice cores, put them in coolers, and then fly those off to uh, uh, freezers at Ohio State University, the Bird Polar Research Center. And then they study the ice. And what they find is long periods of stability, and then this uptick coinciding with the Industrial Revolution where the levels of CO2 start rising. Now, I'm not a scientist. That used to be a dodge, an artful dodge among fellow Republicans. I'll tell you, if you're gonna run for Congress, don't try it. The polling data isn't good on it. It's basically like saying, I'm not a truck driver, therefore I have no position on highway funding. I'm not a doctor, therefore I have no position on healthcare. No, no, that's the idea. You're supposed to go find out something. So, but I'm, I'm not a scientist, but I can tell you what I saw in Antarctica just sort of makes sense, doesn't it? You know, if I'm burning trees in my fireplace this winter here in South Carolina, and it has been chilly lately, not as cold as Texas, but uh, pretty chilly. And so I, I chopped up a red oak, for example, that fell on our property and have been burning it this winter in the fireplace. If I'd left it back in the woods to just rot there over the next 10 or 12 years, it would have basically returned its carbon sequestered in itself back to the atmosphere through a process of rotting and rusting out there. Um, as it is, I bring it inside, I burn in the fireplace. I speed that process up by maybe 10, 12 years. Not a very big deal because same geological time period, not much of an impact. But if I go deep in the earth and pull up trees and vegetation and dinosaurs long gone and under time and temperature and pressure have been turned into fossil fuels, petroleum, natural gas, uh, uh, the coal, bring them to the surface, burn them. I'm changing the chemistry of the air. And by the way, nobody disputes that. Not even the most ardent disputer of climate change would argue that point. And then the physics of light, which have been known since the 1800s, are that uh, light comes in from the sun, strikes the earth, creates radiant heat. All of that heat doesn't go back into space because of the presence of those greenhouse gases. Um, that, like I say, is old science. And again, nobody disputes that. Um, where all the shooting comes from, and this is what I was seeing in Antarctica, is uh, in the modeling. Uh, the uh, that's pretty complicated because, you know, we're trying, we're asking the scientists to model the climate processes of the entire globe. Pretty hard to do, you know, and so um, that's where you can dispute uh, the climate science because some of those, that the models have assumptions, you can pull those out, you can criticize them, and you, and, and rightly so. I mean, that's, that's what science is about, is trying to improve that process of modeling. You know, uh, we've gotten better at modeling, right? Um, the same things that we are talking about here are what we use to predict the path of hurricanes. You know, when I was a kid growing up the coast of South Carolina, you know, uh, hurricanes coming, the cone is somewhere between Miami and, uh, I don't know, Maine. Well, uh, okay, that's a little bit of an exaggeration, but, uh, you know, we're not very good back in modeling in those times, right? Now we're getting better and better. But even, even with Hurricane Irma, which I think you remember if you're in Naples, uh, you know, in the last 24 hours, 
it veered west and came in to see you rather than going straight into Miami as a category five, which was what it was predicted to do. There's the last 24 hours, it shifted. So that's with our eyes on a storm using the same techniques that climate scientists use. And we were off in the last 24 hours by 45 miles. So um, that shows you how we've got a ways to go on the modeling, but in the main, what you've got is the chemistry and the physics indicate that a storm is coming. Whether it's coming to Miami or Naples or to Bluffton, South Carolina, it's coming. That's what the climate science shows. That's what I saw in Antarctica. And then the third step for me in this metamorphosis that turned me from climate conscious denier or disputer of the science, really just consciously indifferent to the science into somebody who's now working on it all the time, was a third, uh, the third step was another trip to uh, a science committee trip and a stopover at the Great Barrier Reef and a um, spiritual awakening really with an Aussie climate scientist. Seems improbable, doesn't it? A spiritual awakening on a godless science committee trip because surely all scientists are godless that we all know that. Um, well, apparently not because this Aussie climate scientist that was showing me the glories of the Great Barrier Reef and telling me the challenges of climate change, um, I could tell without any words being spoken that he and I shared a worldview. You know, St. Francis of Assisi said, preach the gospel at all times, if necessary, use words. And so Scott was preaching the gospel. I could see it in his eyes. I could uh, see it written all over his face that he was worshiping the creator of the corals. He was not worshiping the corals. So later we had a chance to talk and he told me about conservation changes that he was making in his life in order to love God and love people. Um, Scott does some things that maybe some of my conservative friends would find strange. You know, he rides his bike to work, does without air conditioning as much as possible in Townsville, Australia. That's a pretty hot place, as long as his wife and three daughters will let him get away with it. And uh, he hangs the family's clothes out on the line, all to consciously love people coming after us. So I got right inspired. I wanted to be like Scott who's now become a very dear friend. I, I wanted to be like him, uh, loving God and loving people. So I came home and introduced the Raise Wages, Cut Carbon Act of 2009. Note to self, do not introduce carbon tax in midst of great recession when you represent perhaps the reddest district in the reddest state of the nation. It will not go well for you. In fact, didn't go well at all. After 12 years in Congress, I got 29% of the vote in a Republican runoff. The other guy got the other 71% of the vote. Rather spectacular face plant, you got to say. Uh, usually you don't lose that badly after 12 years in Congress. But And, and by the way, I'd committed some other heresies against Republican orthodoxy at the time. I, I, I voted for the Troubled Asset Relief Program. That was President Bush's rescue of the banks. That can never be forgiven by the Tea Party. Um, let's see, what are my other sins? Uh, I should confess them all. Uh, I, I, uh, I was for comprehensive immigration reform, although we never called it that. Uh, the district could probably tell I didn't have it out for gay folks. Um, but my most enduring heresy was just saying that climate change is real and let's do something about it. Um, so at that point, a foundation came to me and said, you know, Inglis, you're rather unusual. Um, an actual conservative, by, by the way, lifetime ratings here, a 93 American conservative union rating, 100% Christian coalition, 100% national right to life, A with the NRA, zero with the Americans for Democratic Action, that's a liberal group, and 23 by some mistake with the AFL-CIO, the labor union, I was really shooting for a zero. Um, so they said an actual conservative, who says climate change is real. Will you speak and write for the proposition? That's what I've been doing ever since. It's now a thing called republicen.org. It's six of us facilitating a community of about 10,000 online. We need a zero on the end of that 10,000. 
And if you'd like to join us, if you're a conservative and you care about climate change, just go to republicen.org and uh, the join button will follow you, whatever page you go on. <laughs> and if you join us, it takes you about 45 seconds, your name, your email address, your zip code, and then we can make you visible to your member of Congress uh, and to your senators so that they know that you exist. So that's what I've been doing. That's how this conservative got into this thing of climate action. And uh, it's, uh, I, I should, uh, before leaving that topic though, just give you some hope. If you're thinking about running for Congress and you're thinking that you care about climate and you're worried, gee, that English, that's a bad commercial for <laughs> taking action on climate. Look what happened to that poor guy. Don't let his shadow fall on me. Um, uh, so let me, let me give some hope. When I was losing, those were in the worst, darkest days of the Great Recession. Uh, we're in some bad economic times now, but different circumstance. Um, the realities of climate change has become more real to people. Uh, the water is coming up and people know it. Uh, we've all had more experiences with climate change, uh, either that way in a coastal place like you're in or through wildfires, through weird weather, we're all becoming more convinced. So says the very clear polling trends. Um, but then there's also this political reality that I wanna make sure you're aware of, is that in 2008, I know this is hard to remember, okay? I was losing in 10, but in 08, consider this. I know it's hard to believe that what I'm about to say. In early 08, Newt Gingrich, was on the couch with Nancy Pelosi in an ad. If you Google Pelosi Gingrich couch, you'll find it. Uh, we don't agree on much, do we, Nancy? No, Newt, but we agree that climate, no, no it says it goes like this. We don't agree on much, do we, Newt? No, Nancy, but we agree that climate change is real and we need to do something about it. That was early 08. By the end of 08, Newt had switched. We don't know, he said, by the end of 08. The intervening events that I can think of were two things. One was the wheels came off the financial system in October of 08. That's when the global financial crisis occurred and started and the Great Recession commenced. Second thing that happened in November of 08, a secret Muslim, non-American socialist was elected to the White House. Well, actually, he's none of those things. And to my party's shame, we called him those names. I fear it was a little bit like uh, saying code language for, yo, there's a black man in the White House. And uh, that's a sad reality, I believe. Uh, what we have to do is turn away from that stuff, not call people names. He's clearly a citizen of the United States, born in Hawaii. That is a state of the United States. And uh, when you you know, push out uh, really lousy information like that, ultimately you'd be embarrassed. So let's stick with the facts, not call people names, debate with him, but, uh, but not call him names. Anyway, so that's, that's when it started. Early, uh, at the end of 08, Republicans went into this position of saying climate change isn't real. Before that, Republicans had been on board to do something about climate change. So here's the good news. I told you there's gonna be some good news and good political news if you wanna run for Congress, um, is it's changed. The decade of disastrous disputation, as we call it, came to an end in 2018. That was a year that Republicans, my party, lost control of the US House. And when we did, it dawned on people like Kevin McCarthy, the Republican leader, that he will never be speaker if he can't win suburban districts and you can't win suburban districts with a retro position on climate change. That fully dawned on Kevin McCarthy. So in January of last year, Kevin was holding a special Republican conference, a hundred Republican members of Congress attended. And the takeaway was Republicans need to change on climate change. Um, your former member of Congress, Francis Rooney, was a big part of that. Um, and so 
the thing has turned around and we're beginning to see progress. So that tells you, I've told you now a lot about how I came to this and then the history of climate action. Uh, the third thing I should do here, and then I'm gonna stop and see your, hear your questions and comments, is talk a little bit about this conservative solution to climate change. And I said at the outset that you'd hear me channeling the late Dr. Milton Friedman. Um, and that is what I'm doing here. You know, we, um, we had an event one time at the University of Chicago called What Would Milton Friedman Do About Climate Change? And uh, the uh, Milton Friedman Chair of Economics told us Dr. Friedman would tax pollution. That's what he'd do. Um, and so um, that, that all that I'm about to describe travels under the very basic concept that you learned in Econ 101, which is internalizing negative externalities. Now that I've given that away, some people will sign off for the webinar because they'll say, oh, I know what he's going to talk about. He's just talking about something very bedrock conservatism. It is. It's rock solid conservatism. Proof of that is this. Milton Friedman, you know, used to get on the Phil Donahue show. I can't see, see all of you, so I can't tell your ages or guess your ages, but maybe some of you are old enough to remember who Phil Donahue was. Uh, if you're too young to remember, well, he's basically a white guy doing an Oprah show. Um, that's who Phil Donahue was. Liberal who used to uh, spar with uh, Milton Friedman, one of Reagan's economics advisors, the father of Chicago School of Economics, one of the really the founders of modern conservatism. So they used to get on and spar. And so on this one episode that you can find on our website, again, republicen.org, uh, uh, Phil Donahue says, well, what do you do about pollution then, Dr. Friedman, if you don't want to regulate it? And Friedman says, you tax it, you tax pollution. And then he goes on to explain this concept of internalizing negative externalities. I'd explain it this way. Let's say I'm Inglis Industries and I make a useful widget that helps the society, um, but part of my process is dirty. And I dump the dirt, the ash, the soot, the whatever, the effluent on my neighbors. Um, most of them are poor. That's why they live near my plant fence. Uh, the real estate's sort of cheaper there. And there they are. They're getting dumped on by my process. Many of them are people of color. Um, they're generally poor. And they are suffering the effects of my pollution. Stinks for them. It's great for me and my customers. Because my customers get a relatively cheap widget. Across town, there's a competitor of mine that can make a very similar widget, uh, but it, its price point is a little bit higher because they have a cleaner process. They don't dump on their neighbors. Well, this arrangement's working out fine for me because I keep on beating them in the marketplace because my widget is cheaper. So along comes somebody, maybe they read Milton Friedman or watched uh, him on the Phil Donahue show. And they say, wait a minute, this isn't right. Inglis, you have to be biblically accountable, man. Hold your ash on your property. Hold your stuff on your property. You can't do on your property something that harms someone else's person or property. Be biblically accountable. Well, I'm heard to say to the local member of Congress, terrible idea. You know what I'm going to have to do? I'm going to have to buy all this new equipment. And when I do, I'm going to, it's going to force the price of my widget up. What we dream of at RepublicEgan.org is more of Milton Friedman in my party, such that conservatives would say to me, if I'm making that case to them, uh, and man up, Inglis, go ahead and buy the equipment. You can't dump on your neighbors. And... If you don't, or when you buy that new equipment, what you're gonna find out is you lose out to that competitor across town. And you know what? Society comes out better because now they've got this, a similar widget that they can use and you're not having somebody dump on their neighbors, causing harm to society. It's bedrock conservatism. 
And, uh, you know, so that's our concept. That's what we go around talking about. And it's the same if I'm producing CO2. Because if my process is producing CO2 and I'm not in some way holding that on my property, sequestering it in some way or somehow dealing with the fact that I'm creating this as part of my process, then I'm getting away with an unrecognized negative externality. So the idea is that process of putting it onto somebody else, that's an externality that I must be held accountable for. When you hold me accountable, good things happen. Innovation happens. Society moves along. Things get better. The air gets cleaner. If you let me get away with it, I'll keep burning up the, the, the Cuyahoga River. It'll keep catching on fire. Um, I'll keep on dumping into the air as long as you let me. But if you make me accountable, then good things start happening. Innovation flourishes. That's what we're about with a carbon tax. And so just briefly, this carbon tax would be like this. Apply it at the pipeline and at the mine. There are under 2,000 companies that either put stuff in a pipeline that ends up at your gas station or at the airport for Jet A. Um, uh, and, uh, and, and under 2,000 companies that either do that or that, that mine coal. Very small for job for the IRS to put on the carbon tax. Let's say it's uh, $25 per ton of emitted CO2 out of the stuff that's going to come out of that pipeline, be burned out of the pipeline, or be burned out in that, and when burning that coal. And by the way, the science on that's very clear. We know pretty precisely how much CO2 is going to be generated from those sources. So then we put the tax on there, $25 a ton, let's say. It results in a 21 cent per gallon increase in the price of gasoline at your local gas station. And it results in an $11 per month increase in the average home's electricity. Uh, terrible idea, right? Vote Inglis for Congress. He wants to increase the price of your gasoline and the price of your electricity. Uh, but hold on. We'd make this a conservative carbon tax. We'd pair it with a dollar for dollar reduction in your other taxes or a dividend of all of that new revenue from the carbon tax back to the citizens. So there's no growth of government. And that's what we think is the pretty exciting opportunity here. In fact, my bill would have cut payroll taxes. That's the FICA tax. Um, uh, on your pay stub, you know, it's 6.2% employee reduction in your paycheck, but the employer is paying 6.2%. If you're self-employed, you get the privilege of paying the entire 12.4%. It's a whopping tax on the first dollar of income. It's the most regressive tax we've got. Regressive meaning it harms poor people. And so you reduce that tax and you put on that carbon tax I just described, the Congressional Budget Office says the bottom 70% of Americans do better because their income has just been untaxed. Part of their income has been untaxed. And they're paying a, a carbon tax that can be avoided, evaded, turn down the thermostat, um, drive less in your car, um, do things to, uh, to save energy and you can avoid some of that tax, but you can't avoid the payroll tax. And so you, you make the bottom 70% better by shifting that tax off income on pollution. And then the second thing about this carbon tax, it has to be special, and then we'll move on to your questions and comments, is you got to make it border adjustable. Um, and that means you would apply the tax to imports coming from countries that don't have the same price on carbon dioxide. Um, and this is essential. Um, what I just described, that revenue neutrality, where you cut taxes somewhere else, you put on the carbon tax, you cut taxes somewhere else, that's essential for conservatives. Uh, this thing I'm describing here, border adjustment, is uh, crucial to conservatives and progressives, because we all agree about this, that if we're, if, if we're gonna import stuff from China, we've got to make it so they're paying the carbon tax. If not, you disadvantage American manufacturing, but most importantly, you don't get the world in 
on acting on climate change. So it's crucial to get the world in. And here's how we think you can do that, is you apply that tax. Let's say there's a sheet of flat steel coming through, I don't know, the port of Miami right now. It's coming from China. It's Chinese state-run industry. They stole the technology. Uh, here it comes, uh, landing in the, at the port. Uh, we apply our tax, carbon tax, based on American equivalent uh, sheets of flat steel. Um, the Chinese object in the World Trade Organization saying that's an impermissible tariff, you can't do that. We think they lose that case based on precedents in the chemical industry that say you can have a content tax where you tax stuff coming in based on the content of what it is. And this would be a carbon content tax. So we think we win that case. If we're right, 24 hours after they lost, China would impose the same price on carbon dioxide. Why? Well, because they just paid in Miami a tax that's being remitted to Washington. If they'd collected that tax internal to China, it would have been remitted to Beijing and the sheet of flat steel would have come through the port of Miami with no adjustment. So 24 hours later, because they, they do have an amazing way of reaching consensus in China, they'd have the same price on carbon dioxide. And then the whole world's following. And conservatives listening to me, can you, do you see the beauty of that? No international agreement, no bowing and scraping at the UN, just a bold move by the United States that says, we're gonna price carbon dioxide and it's gonna be in your interest to follow our lead. Oh, you don't wanna follow our lead? Well, fine. We've got an enormous deficit and a terrible debt. So you keep on paying our carbon tax through the port of Miami and we'll keep on accepting it. Thank you very much. But it'll probably be in your interest to do the same thing. And then when they do the same thing, the whole world is acting. And the whole world is seeing what Milton Friedman would call a price signal. And they're moving away from it. They're, they're saying, ooh, ooh, that hurts. You got to pay tax. I think I'll move away from that. I'll substitute to other technology. And then free enterprise takes off. And we have an energy revolution that's sort of like the tech revolution that gave us what we're doing right now, something that didn't exist, say, 10, 15 years ago. And energy will be the same way. So um, let me stop there, except say one more thing. All of this I've just put, as I said, I could keep on citing Milton Friedman. I could cite Arthur Art Laffer, another one of Reagan's economics advisors. He's on our website too. Um, I'm using all this high octane conservative language. And if it sounds familiar to you and you're a progressive, it might be because it's the same thing that Al Gore has been for for about 30 years, literally. And so uh, our great hope at republician.org is that we can actually bring America together and lead the world to solutions. And so um, that's why I'm happy to be with you and looking forward to your questions and comments. I'm happy to hear any comments as well as questions. If you just want to tell me, make some suggestions to me about how to pull this off, I'd be glad to see that. And also I would point out in the chat, by the way, uh, Price Atkins of our team has added there a link for you to sign up at republicen.org. Uh, I think it's the uh, it's uh, right uh, second thing down in the chat. So please uh, sign up, take you about 45 seconds. So Rob, can I hand it back to you for questions or is that Anna or Jennifer? I don't know who's doing the questions. Um, well, thank you, Bob, for such an interesting and thought provoking presentation. It's making me think back to that economics class very carefully, right? <laughs> yeah. um, We'll be handling the questions you know, with Jennifer. And I'm gonna start with just a couple that were sent to us in advance because um, some people had suggested some questions they would like to he hear answered. And then we do invite everyone to chime in. The chat's being monitored and Jennifer will handle that portion. So one of the questions that came to us early on is that we see your proposal very similar to the Baker Schultz proposal, right? Yeah. But in what way is the proposed carbon tax revenue neutral? 
wouldn't the increased cost of the energy tax start leading towards some inflationary tendencies? Um, well, yes, uh, two things there. Uh, part of it is that we're, we're, we're uh, very open to the Baker Schultz proposal. You know, it's, it basically, it, it's, it recycles the revenue, if you will, in a slightly different way than I would have in my bill. My bill was a payroll tax cut, the FICA tax cut that I was just describing. Um, I, I, I actually prefer that because I think it's, it's uh, simpler, administratively simpler. Um, and uh, it also has the benefit that it's literally what Al Gore has been for for 30 years. Um, and so um, um, that has some nice symmetry there. But I got to admit, though, the Baker Schultz plan, which takes the money and sends it back to people in a dividend check, similar to the way that the Alaska Permanent Fund works. You know, if you're an Alaska citizen, you get a check each year based on uh, the amount of oil that they've sold, the, the revenue, the, the, the royalties they get from the sale of oil. And so, uh, Alaskans really like that. And so, so the, um, the thing about the Baker Schultz proposed a check in the mail, at republician.org, we're, open. we're open to either of those, whichever one you want to do. Um, cut payroll taxes or uh, dividend the money back to folks. Will it create inflation? Second part of your question, Anna. Um, uh, yes, um, it would. It create the uh, price increases in energy. And that means that uh, you have to cover that with that either the dividend back to people or with the payroll tax reduction. Um, the people who aren't paying payroll taxes are retirees. And so in my bill that I had in 2009, we would have had a prospective increase in social security payments to anticipate that inflation that would be in the, evident in the energy sector. So yes, it is inflationary, but it's not term. <laughs> now I sound not like an occurring. What I mean is that it's not like we're, uh, we're, we're coming up with something that doesn't have some basis in realities on the ground. The realities on the ground are that English industries that I was just describing that's dumping on my poor neighbors is causing a cost to society. You put that cost on my product so that my customers see it, that's not artificial. That's not some sort of bad kind of inflation. That's what you call accountability. And that's a good thing <laughs> to make my product look, uh, to, to make my product sell at its actual cost. So it's not like hurting other people. If I get away with hurting other people, these not these people that don't join my transaction, as you'll hear in that Milton Friedman clip, he says that's when government has to step in. Government has to step in, says Dr. Friedman, when two people are doing something that harms a third person who didn't voluntarily enter the transaction. That's a role for government. Um, and so it uh, it gets to basically what we believe and what we think is right. It's, it's not, uh, in other words, yes, prices go up, but they're not going up artificially. They're going up to the true price, the real actual price. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, another question that came in is, I think relating more to the current environment. So they asked, how do you see conservatives and people in the legislative branch now working with the new Biden administration and some of their proposals for curbing emissions? Are these things um, contradictory? Can we do both? Should we do both? I think it's essential that we find a way to get to bipartisanship on this. And it's essential that we have a legislative solution. You know, um, a, a president can do a lot by executive orders. Um, that's what, uh, you know, Obama did some, Trump undid them, Biden undid the undoing. You know, in other words, that, that's what executive orders are about. Pendulum swinging. Um, and that's why they have some power, but not all powerful. Power, the better 
exercise of power would come through the legislative process. And it's best if that is bipartisan because bipartisan legislation is durable legislation. The Obamacare uh, package proves that. You do something on one side of the aisle, pendulum swings and the other side tries to undo it. Well, we can't do that in climate change. We are seeing the whites of its eyes now. We have waited too long. We got to take a shot and it's got to be a good shot. And so we don't have time for policy instability, a little bit like the way Australia did a carbon tax, they undid it. They did it, they undid it. We can't do that. We're the world's leading economy and we've got to make reasonable policy, make it bipartisan and therefore durable. So it's essential to find Republican support for climate action. Um, and that's why um, I hope, and I think there are indications from the Biden administration that they intend to reach out to Republicans on climate. I just hope that what we, we think it takes though is Republicans being receptive. And there are plenty of Republicans in Congress right now who want to act on climate. They're seeking permission from their constituents and they test around they use some language what do you think could i would you go with me on this would you go with me on that that's what they're basically doing republican members of congress are trying it out seeing if it fits seeing if the shoe fits see if they can walk across their district in those shoes um, and so what we think we've got to do at republican.org is help build support a visible audible space of support for those members of Congress, Republicans who want to engage in this debate and want to come forward with these kind of solutions. And like I say, isn't it exciting that if Milton Friedman were still alive, he'd be agreeing with Al Gore as to the solution. Um, and we'd be able to, in normal times where we aren't fighting like cats and dogs, um, to come to an agreement, lead the world. Um, so, but it, but it, what it takes is um, backing off this partisan uh, divide a little bit and uh, seeking the common good. And uh, that's what we got to all be hoping for um, and got to pave the way for that in, in constituencies in Florida and elsewhere. I'm going to um, uh, add some, some more questions. Uh, we've got quite an active audience and the chat is completely full. But first I wanna say that you have laid out a tremendous story and you have given such a great explanation of what we call climate justice and uh, you know environmental racism and the dumping on your neighbor. That was um, a beautiful story. And I really appreciate that. Um, I also appreciate that you are encouraging people to contact their Congress people and say, we do support you know, these kinds of solutions with innovation and technology, because that's, we know that's how we get policy to change. We have to have engagement. And both Growing Climate Solutions and Eco America Path to Positive, we're all about engaging the public. So let's get a few questions. Um, there's one I saw that is, uh, actually two of them I want to try to combine because they sort of go together. One from Ken says, do you believe that steps beyond a carbon tax are necessary for the U.S. to reach net zero carbon? And, and how do you get that through Congress? And then there's another one. What is your stance on moving towards other energy solutions like wind and solar? So those are sort of two sides of the same question. And that one's from Jesse. Yeah, so... Uh... Uh, the first question, uh, it's not going to be enough to do a carbon tax that I've just described. We have to do other stuff too. Uh, but um, most economists would tell you it's the first and most obvious thing to do is to put on a carbon tax. And I know in this age of political overstatement, that sounds like an overstatement. How could Anglis be right that most economists would, would say it's the first and most obvious thing to do? I'm telling you, it is most economists. <laughs> um, in fact, it's really hard to find economists who disagree with that notion. I once asked, I was visiting in the pre-times, the before times when we actually used to go places rather than Zoom places. I was uh, at Virginia Tech and I asked a senior economist, in other words, 
uh, an, an older faculty member, I said to him, give me the name an economist I should read that would disagree with this concept of internalizing negative externalities through a pricing mechanism. And he sat back in his chair and he thought, and he said, can't think of one. He said, in fact, you can't be an economist if you disagree with that. Um, he said, it'd be like being a scientist and not believing in the scientific method. So I'm, I know it sounds like an overstatement, but really most economists, you'd, you'd find it hard to find an economist who disagree with that, that uh, you, a carbon tax makes sense as a way to internalize negative externalities, pretty efficient way to do it. And most of them would say, that's what you do. And that's, that's economists on the left from Paul Krugman to Greg Mankiw or Art Laffer on the right. Um, and so, um, so that's, uh, but what we would need, it's the first most obvious thing to do, but is it sufficient? No, uh, probably not enough uh, of a price signal for the transportation sector. As I just said, $25 a ton is just 21 cents a gallon. $40 a ton is sort of like 40 cents a gallon. It's basically a penny for a dollar. Um, so not a terribly strong uh, price signal in the transportation sector. So you might want to continue to raise cafe standards, the fuel efficiency standards for automobiles. Um, is this carbon tax enough to stop fugitive emissions of methane? Leaky pipes, bad wells, probably not. That's probably susceptible only to a regulatory solution. There, a Republican just said the word, the R word, regulatory. Um, I mean, that's right. You, you got to probably in those two cases, you got to do some more stuff besides the carbon tax. And then about Jesse's question about wind and solar. Here, here's here's oh, I'm going to go real high octane on you here. This is Milton Friedman to the max. Okay, we would eliminate the electric car subsidy we would eliminate the production tax credit for wind. We would eliminate the uh, investment tax credit for solar. We would eliminate uh, under market leases on public land for the extraction of minerals. We'd want those to be at market rates. Uh, we'd eliminate the biggest subsidy of them all, which is being able to dump into the trash dump of the sky without paying a tipping fee. We think it's rock solid conservatism to eliminate all those subsidies. The first ones are explicit subsidies. That last one is an implicit subsidy and it's huge. It dwarfs those others. So a lot of conservatives on talk radio, whatever, like to yak about uh, you know, these uh, electric car credits or things like that. Well, okay, let's go to the granddaddy of them all which is you and me being able to drive in our internal combustion car with no accountability coming out the tailpipe. Um, and uh, so we, we, we'd eliminate all those subsidies, level the playing field, and then watch the free enterprise system deliver innovation faster than government regulations or mandates or fickle tax incentives could ever imagine. And again, isn't it great that I'm joined in that by Al Gore? I mean, I know I'm a conservative and I'm supposed to hate the guy, but he's been very kind to me since I left Congress. Um, and I got no reason to particularly to hate Al Gore. Um, and isn't it great that he would agree with that? It sounds like there's a joke there somewhere. Um, isn't, it, isn't it great that he's yeah. made, oh. making a lot of money in the free enterprise system? We're losing you a little bit there, Bob. I think your internet is a little shaky, but um, I was gonna say, that sounds like the beginning of a great joke that Bob Inglis and Al I might've smelched out there for a second. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's right. Uh, walked into a bar and said something. Anyway, yes. <laughs> uh, so uh, yeah, my, my internet went unstable there for a second, but now back with you, I think. Terrific. Yeah, I think we got the gist of it and uh, appreciate that answer. And, and following along, we've got a lot of energy experts in the audience today. Following that, uh, somebody has asked um, about the burden. This is Kathy's question. What about the burden on the extractive industries who are struggling now because we're going through this energy transition? 
and you know coal and gas are in decline. So what what is your perspective on how we help in that transition? Yeah, it's going to be real hurt to some communities that are really dependent on those fossil fuels and the revenues that come from from them. For example, I was in a town in Utah back in the before times, um, and uh, it's an oil town. Uh, the public library, the roads, the county administration, basically everything runs on oil revenues. Um, and I was with a guy who owned a radio station there. He says, I've got everything I own in this radio station. It's in a town dependent on oil revenue. Um, so it's not just the public sector, it's that private sector guy, right? With a radio station, all dependent on oil and the revenues that come from it. So um, we got to, we got to cope with that um, and we got to figure out some way to make it smoother for them. And this is not unlike what we experienced in South Carolina. When the textile industry went kaput, you know, um, the, uh, uh, the, the agreement on uh, uh, the kinds of stuff you could bring in and where you could bring it in from expired and the textile industry here went under. We, we were called the textile capital of the world. Well, thank goodness, just before that agreement expired, uh, a great governor from South Carolina, a Republican named Carol Campbell, the late Carol Campbell, personally recruited BMW to Spartanburg, South Carolina. BMW means Bubba makes wheels. Um, and so they came to South Carolina and they got something like seven or $8 billion on the ground over there in Spartanburg. They literally replaced the textile industry. And so what I'd say to West Virginia, and I have said it to audiences in West Virginia, is coal is going under the bus, just like textiles went under the bus. And you need a Carol Campbell to find something new to bring to West Virginia. And what I'd suggest to them is pretty small state, problem with the internet, figure out a way in this infrastructure package to get a deal, uh, Senator Manchin, to say, uh, Joe, Joe Biden, I need money to cover the entire state of West Virginia with broadband. And then I'm gonna advertise the state of West Virginia as what a great place to live. You wanna surf West Virginia? You know, if you're into kayaking, there's no, it's a great place to do that. West Virginia, it's a beautiful place. As long as they stop taking off the tops of their mountains. Um, and you can see the point I'm making is that you gotta innovate. This is, you gotta move. You can't, you can't assume you're gonna do coal the rest of your life, just like we couldn't assume we're gonna do textiles the rest of our lives in South Carolina, we now make cars and make some fine cars here. West Virginia can do other stuff. So can Wyoming, so can that town in Utah, but the transition is hard. So I would say um, if I were still in Congress and at the negotiating table, and this were in a conference and say Mitch McConnell from Kentucky said to me, uh, uh, you know, if you want me to support this conference report, you're going to have to give me something. I'd say, yes, sir, what do you need? He'd probably say, I need a buyout of the miners' pensions. I'd say, got it. What else you need? He'd say, I need retraining assistance. Got it, Mitch. What else you need? Uh, I need relocation assistance. Got it, Mitch. What else you need? In other words, I was just describing revenue neutrality where we give all the money back to the citizens or we, div we cut taxes somewhere else. I just cut into that a little bit, but those are small cuts. I mean, the, 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 num the numbers there are quite small and we, could, we got the revenue from the carbon tax. We could easily take care of those communities that are impacted like that. And so, um, yeah, that's what you do with some of the revenue. You take care of those communities. And your description of the broadband and uh, technology reminds me of how the Republic of Ireland turned its economy around uh, in becoming, you know, sort of a technology center. Yeah, great example. A absolutely. So we have a couple of, I think they're accountants or tax accountants and, uh, who are asking some questions. So I'm going to try to combine these. Mm -hmm. uh, we have Kathy saying, reducing FICA means reduced funding for Social Security and Medicare 
how is that accounted for if FICA is chosen as the tax reduction that allows the carbon tax? And then Ty says, do you experience pushback on your legislation because of the FICA tax reduction? Uh, it seems many politicians don't want to touch that third rail. <laughs> yeah, great questions. Yes, FICA, uh, that, that 6.2 percent employees, 6.2 percent employer funds Social Security. There's an additional Medicare tax. It's 1.45% employer um, for Social Security. Ideas. Okay, I'm a conservative and I'm going to go ahead and start any lost. Well, I'm not running for president and I'll just speak the truth. It is a Ponzi scheme. Um, and what I mean is it counts on the current uh, participants to pay out the earlier entrance into the system. That's what it is. But anyway, you can't make it any worse than it already is, is what I'd say. And the way to make it no worse than it already is, is to do this carbon tax, because the carbon tax would necessarily have to be, and this is real good for climate action, would have to be steadily rising. Reason is, I'm gonna sound like an economist again, um, uh, there's a thing called this. Uh-oh, you're frozen again is once uh, Bob, you're going to have to reset that. Oh, it's chickens and chickens go. Uh oh, am I back now? You said Let's there's see. a thing called and then yeah, you went, am I back? Yes, you're back now. So oh, yes. Uh, okay. Sorry, I'm back. Sorry. So uh, there's a thing called the substitution effect. And so um, that would uh, that uh, it's like this if uh, if the price of chicken goes up for some reason, people substitute to beef. Um, they consumers see a price and they move away from the thing that's gone up in price and choose a thing that's maybe lower. Sorry, folks, we're having difficulty with technology again. Uh, Bob, I wonder if we can, uh, there you go. You're back now. What? You are going to, to move away from the good it is our English do that, aren't you? Hey, yes. Are you still there? Um, let's see if I'm, and now you're hearing me. Okay. We can hear you now, fine. Okay, good, sorry. Um, so, um, so we gotta make this carbon tax steadily rising in order to make sure that the substitution effect doesn't harm social security, keep social security uh, where it is, um, uh, no worse off than it is. I mean, let me just tell you, we gotta do something about social security long-term. Uh, the social security trustees are apoplectic about the circumstances of social security. But most of us don't really notice they're, that they're turning blue over there. I mean, they're, they're blue in the face because they really are apoplectic about the, uh, the, the future of social security. But that's sort of 10 years off or 15 years off. But if you're a young person, you really want somebody to do something about social security. But what I'm saying here is this carbon tax has to be done in such a way that it doesn't harm social security. And that's by making a steadily rising carbon tax. Well, Bob, it sounds like you have thought through all the um, political trials and challenges that come with some of these stances. And we um, appreciate so much your perspective. There even more questions that are in the chat. There are questions that came in ahead of time. Uh, people really appreciate the guidance on how to move a conservative community forward. Uh, and you're right, Utah has done it. Um, and you know, we hope that, that Growing Climate Solutions is doing it in Southwest Florida. And your words have been tremendously helpful. Anna, uh, I don't know if it's uh, time to wrap up with our final slides, if, if you wanna ask one more question or if I know the technology has been a little bit of an issue. Thanks everybody for hanging in there. Anna, a few. Okay, I think that we've gotten a great perspective and hopefully we have a transcript of the chat. Um, perhaps Bob would be willing to answer some of these questions directly back to folks. 
Um, I really enjoyed this conversation. And Bob, I really want to thank you for an interesting perspective and a well thought out perspective, because this is the real way to build consensus through really engaging discussion with people of diverse perspectives. So I also want to thank our audience. Thank you for spending this afternoon with us and for your curiosity to learn about climate. So if you can put up our closing slides, um, what next, right? How do you engage? So first I, want, I will be sending out a brief sur survey about this presentation probably later tonight or tomorrow to everyone who was listening and signed up. Please, please take a few moments. It's only about eight questions to give us some feedback so that we can both understand our audience and improve the programming of growing climate solutions. And where do we go from here? Well, we want you. How do we engage you? I ask you that if you find this discussion interesting and if you find our mission compelling, please subscribe to Growing Climate Solutions. Go on our website, check us out and subscribe to the newsletter. Um, you'll get some easy reading and relevant articles to engage you in all aspects of climate. Um, if you're interested in a national perspective, you should also look at our, you know, affiliate Path to Positive Solutions and the Eco America website. They cover a more national perspective and have all kinds of interesting uh, resources for you to check out. Follow us on social media and on Twitter. Tell, uh, tell your friends and family about us. Tell them to check out our website or sign up on the social media platform because we really want your input. And mostly, if you're a business leader, if you run an organization, whether it's a civic group or a social group, if you're a business owner and you find this discussion compelling, maybe you want to be a partner of Growing Climate Solutions. Go to the web page, contact me directly. I can send you information about joining us as a partner. And um, next slide. And I also want to finally make a plug for the two additional presentations in our three-part series. So a month from about today on March 24th, we're going to take up a new topic. We're going to be speaking with retired Rear Admiral Jonathan White, and he's going to discuss how the climate interacts with our national security and with oceans. What are the challenges? And again, most importantly, what are the opportunities here? And finally, in April during uh, the Earth Day week, we're going to be presenting the last in this uh, first season of Climate Compass with Professor Benjamin White from the Wharton School of Business. And he's going to be talking about real estate and what's happening with coastal real estate values. So we're really trying to engage different perspectives and we hope you'll join us for each of them and bring along maybe a friend, a family, a work person to sit in and listen to the presentations with you. So thank you so much. Next slide. And I hope you'll reach out to us. I thank our sponsors, particularly WGCU and the Naples Daily News and News Press and our funders for all the support they give Growing Climate Solution. And thank you so much, Eco America, for hosting with me um, and taking this on. We really appreciate your guidance and leadership. And with this, we draw it to a close. Please stay engaged with both of us. Thank you so much.